Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Your daily encouragement that God has the world in the hollow of his hand. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles. Here it is, Monday. Happy Monday to you. What are you about today? <laughs> okay, I'm not Carmen. You can tell that. I'm Paul, usually the producer. Ryan is doing that job today. Thank you, Ryan. He's just nodding. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> well, this is still Mornings with Carmen. Okay, Mornings Without Carmen here on Faith Radio. She'll be back a week from today. But, um, hey, thanks for joining me. Okay, what are you about today? Are you on your way to work? If you're like many people, you are. Is your job your passion job, one you just can't wait to get to? You're looking forward to clocking in today. Or maybe the job you're going to right now was a passion job, and now you're feeling, hmm, eh, it pays the bills. Or maybe the job you're going to right now, it's not the one you studied for, it's not the one you really wanted, but you need to provide for your family. Get that. Regardless... I want you to hear these words. I saw this article from uh, Catherine Butler, who's, among other things, she's a homeschool mom, and she's a writing teacher as well. And she talks about our attitude and what we do. Now, again, she was a writing teacher, and she talks about how before Thanksgiving, the high, at a high school writer's workshop, she said, I was teaching, uh, as I, that I teach, I was concluding the semester with a cookies and Q&A. The students put aside their writing assignments, and instead of unpacking excerpts from the Puritans, we munched on snickerdoodles and talked about the more granular details of the writerly life. A talented group of writers. The students had prepared long lists of questions about world building and outlining and character and de- character development and so on. And as I navigated the tangles of inquiries as best I could, about a half hour of unraveling these details and such... She stopped, and she said, okay, before we go any further, she said, holding up her hand and trying to ignore the flush of shame that warmed her cheeks, you're looking for advice. The single best piece of advice I can give you is something I learned from my pastor. If you learn nothing else from this class, please remember this one thing. Approach every piece of writing as an offering to the Lord. Catherine shared about how years earlier she was overcome with anxiety regarding her writing work. All these ideas swirling in her mind. Did she get them down on paper right? Will people misunderstand? Will she offend anyone? Is she wasting her time? It was into this that her pastor spoke wisely. Your work is an offering to the Lord, and your job is to walk as faithfully as you can with what you have to offer. What the Lord chooses to do with your finished product is according to his will, not yours. She continued, since that conversation on a drab winter's evening, I cleave to these words during moments of burnout, doubt, and exhaustion. They've infused me with new strength when I've been bone weary. And they've freed me to approach each new project with joy, knowing that any good that arises from my scribblings is God's doing, not my own. You know, listening to Catherine or reading that, I get that. Now, I'm guest hosting this week. A lot of thoughts are going through my head. Do I get the points I want to across well? Do I ask good enough questions in the conversations with the guest? I don't want to be wasting their time. I don't want to be wasting your time either. But first, I, you, you know, with whatever job we have, Whatever tasks we face today, are we seeking it first and foremost as an offering to our God? Every customer or client we work with, every widget we make, every dish we scrub, every entry on a spreadsheet, everything we do on behalf of the company we work for, are we first doing it on behalf of our God? I'm trying to keep that in mind today. Hope you can join me in that. For the glory of Jesus today, right? 
Let's make today an offering to him. Well, again, this is Mornings with Carmen. And, okay, yesterday I got a text, and it's this. It's AT&T. We apologize for Thursday's outage, which may have impacted your ability to connect with others. We value you as a customer and commit to doing better. <laughs> yeah, they had a software glitch. Then they were doing an update that caused the system to crash. Oh, by the way, if you are an AT&T customer, sometime in the next two billing cycles, you'll get a $5 credit because of the boo-boo. Then again, it's my cell phone. I spent too much time with it. Maybe that was the first thing. When you got out of bed this morning, or actually even before you got out of bed, the alarm went off. Was, maybe your phone is your alarm. So, of course, you're grabbing that. But then what do you do after that? Do you turn off the alarm and do other stuff? Or do you start scrolling on your phone, checking emails, any texts that came in overnight, jumping on Facebook or such, even before your feet hit the floor? It's like you're looking for that dopamine buzz. Is this healthy? Are you addicted to your phone? Like me? Okay, I don't look at it first thing, but still, I spend too much time on it. And I guess this is going to be intervention time, but uh, Dr. Linda Mintel is going to join us shortly here on Mornings with Carmen. Thank you again for listening to Faith Radio. Well, again, thanks for listening to Faith Radio. I'm Paul filling in for Carmen. And do you do any fasting during Lent? Now, over the years, I've usually done some fasting, and it's usually food-related. But this year, because I've noticed, or should I say my wife has noticed, uh, that I've become addicted again to my cell phone. I've, I've done things like putting my social media, uh, pulling that off of my phone. And you know what? It's hard. It really can be. Well, joining us now is uh, Dr. Linda Mintel, who you can hear weekends here on Faith Radio with the Dr. Linda Mintel Show. And, okay, Linda, help me out here. Why, why are cell phones, our tablets, our TVs, why are they so addicting? Well, first, let me just say, Paul, it's so good to talk to you in person because we always talk behind the scenes. Yeah, so we usually nice talk behind you. everybody else's backs. Now we're talking <laughs> yeah. in front of their backs. So. We have great conversations yeah. sometimes that should be included in the show, right? Because <laughs> we're talking, you and I and Carmen, a lot of times behind the scenes. But um, it's such a great topic. And I, I love the fact that you're tying this to Lent because it isn't something that people always think that could be one of those things that you give up for a period of time. But here's the deal. You know, dopamine is one of those brain chemicals that most people have heard of because it's the happy, feel-good uh, chemical. And dopamine is very much related to that reward pathway in the brain that often gets activated when you eat something really great, actually when you have sex, um, when you feel something very pleasurable. Uh, and it's also one of those pathways that gets activated with drug use, which is one of the reasons that people continue to use drugs, because when you're using drugs, there's a pleasurable feeling, usually some type of euphoria or something that happens, and it activates that pathway and makes you feel good for the moment. Well, no surprise here that uh, social media, media, binging on Netflix, those type of social media, media activities also activate that dopamine pathway. And so while this is not considered on the same level of like a drug addiction, there is a psychological and an addictive parts of this because of that activation of that reward pathway that does play out to us. So we have to be careful with how much of this we consume because we know that in that consumption, um, it is going to eventually affect uh, other parts of our life, in particular our mood and anxiety and other mm -hmm. things that we don't always think about initially. Okay. One thing we got to back up and say, okay, God put dopamine in our bodies for a reason. Right. And you mentioned some of them because, for example, when we're getting a hug or, or such, that is a good thing. It helps bo build bonding, right? Right. Right. And and there are things, I mean, food is nourishing to our body, but there also it also has great taste. And, you know, there are times when we get pleasure from food. Exercise is another way that those pathways get activated that help us with our mood. And so when we're talking about how did God create us, he put in this chemical and these pathways, and there are natural ways that they get activated that are actually healthy for us. Where we have to be careful is when we're activating them 
in ways that are not healthy for us. And I think excessive consumption of social media can be one of those ways. So when it comes to dealing with that, like I'm trying to right now as I try to <laughs> detox, and I, it, it, the hard thing is I can't get rid of my phone. I need it because of right. some family stuff. I need it because of work. It, it's, it's kind of a multi-purpose thing on my hip most of the time here. But, okay, I can't get rid of it, but I also need to regulate it. And that right. that's the hard part. So what... Yeah. What, what advice do you give? Because, okay, we can't just totally get rid of the cell phone. And, you know, a lot of us use our computers and our tablets for work or at home because we have to do our budgets or whatever. Finding that balance, how do you help us do that? You know, it's it's such a good point. And in some ways, it's a little bit like food because you can get excessive with food, right? And engage mm-hmm. in compulsive eating or some type of an eating disorder. But you can't eliminate food from your life or you'd have a serious problem of not being alive, right? So um, it's, but this is really uh, a need. You're, I think you're exactly right. It's There's really a need for regulation because, you know, it's funny, one of the um, leading experts of uh, looking at social media from, um, I don't remember what school she's with, but she's a, she's a psychiatrist with a dual diagnosis addiction unit. And she wrote a book on on uh, the dopamine uh, problem in our country. And she calls it like the hyperdermic needle of our day. <laughs> so mm. she really she really puts that emphasis on, you know, you if you're injecting too much of this into your life, it can become a problem. So again, we go back to the principles of scripture, all things in moderation. We do have to use it. You definitely have to use it for work. I have yeah. to use it for work. We have to use it. We use it positively to connect with family members. I mean, how many times have we had family members who've had emergencies, they text us or they, you know, they call us and they we use our devices, right, to connect. And and it helps a lot of people with just connection when you live far away from your family. But regulating it is really the key. And one of the things that you can do, which I think is is helpful, is do what they sometimes call a dopamine detox. Okay. And that simply just means that you get off of your social media or you dramatically limit it for a period of time and see what happens. Because when you get off of it, a lot of times what happens to people is they get very anxious Mm -hmm. and they feel like, you know, where's my phone? It almost becomes an extension of your physical body, like you mentioned. Yeah. And so it feels a little anxiety producing. But if you can get through... Uh, about a 24 hour period and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to restrict my use. I'm going to put it down. I think really practical things like when you're talking to someone in your family, no devices, you know, when you're out to dinner, no devices, when you're trying to deal with your kids and you're, you're interacting as a family, no devices. I mean, just think of practical ways that you can limit this when you're sitting down at night Instead of spending hours on your phone, maybe read a book or um, do something active and, you know, do something that would be exercise or something that would bring your family into a fun endeavor like a game or something that you could do together. So just begin to think about ways that you could replace all that phone use or tablet use or whatever you use with some other types of activities that actually can bring more connection and meaning in -hmm. your life as well. You know, as part of the Lenten thing that I was mentioning earlier, it's like, okay, it's not just, uh, it's not just enough to take away a certain thing. It's an important thing to do during that time is replace it usually, you know, with prayer or Mm -hmm. or something else. I do have to tell you this story, Linda, though, because it has to do with a college professor here at the University of Northwestern. And he did this to his students. It's amazing how because I'm addicted to something, when somebody else does something with a device that is not right, they the students freaked out. He had, okay, it was a burner phone. It was an old phone of his. He, he was no longer using, but he did it as an example. It's like talking about our phones and how we use them and, he, and how we become so dependent. So what does he do? He drops it on the floor. And then he kicks it out the door, and you could just sense the other students were kind of going, Gasp. ah, exactly, they're <laughs> gasping, they're gasping at this. And uh, Anyway, but... As you're talking about getting back on track here, you're talking about dopamine. This is something you probably have to do a detox every now and then because, as I said, I got re-addicted. Yeah, and I like what you said about replacing because that is really 
it is uh, part of what we do in Lent, but it's part of what we need to do to be healthy is replacing it with better, healthier coping habits and ways that we use our time. And I know that it's so much easier for me to just get on my phone and maybe play a game than it is for me to open my devotional, sit quietly before the Lord and spend some time meditating on the word, which would be so much better for my soul and for my mood um, than it than it would be if I was sitting there just playing a mindless game. So I think that that substitution is really important. How do we spend our time? And one of the questions I always ask is what is what I'm doing going to help things from an eternal perspective? Yeah. And that really sort of convicts you when you start to think about all the things that you spend your day being busy about, and you're not doing things that have eternal value. So. Mm-hmm. I think those are good good little prescriptions we can give everybody to cut back. Exactly. Again, we're talking with Dr. Linda Mintel this morning here on Faith Really, as we do every other week here. And as we continue, okay, we live in a world where sometimes loneliness is celebrated. You know, you've seen the movies where there's the superhero fighting crime alone or or Okay, maybe you're into Westerns, and there's the the gunslinger who rides into town alone. He takes down the bad guys, and what does he do? He rides off alone into the sunset. Okay, that's one thing, but the problem is loneliness. It hurts at so many levels. And we're going to talk about moving from loneliness to connection next as we continue here on Faith Radio. 150 million people, 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live, any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night. Download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. So do you feel unseen, even though you're surrounded by a bunch of people? Maybe you have a passion for something, a cause you feel God has put on your heart, but you haven't found anyone else with a similar passion or drive. How do you move from loneliness to connection? And that's something we want to talk about next here with Dr. Linda Mintel here on Faith Radio. Again, you can hear Dr. Linda Mintel every weekend, the Dr. Linda Mintel Show here on Faith Radio. And as I was reading an article you had up, Linda, uh, about from moving from loneliness to connection, you know, oftentimes we see loneliness as this big umbrella thing, but you talked about there's different types of loneliness and you marked three from a, from a study from a surgeon general. Yeah, the the biggest one that obviously people struggle with is just feeling lonely by not having uh, very meaningful, intimate relationships. And it's interesting um, that w- I was listening to what you were saying, and one of the shows that we're going to do that's coming up soon on the weekend show on My Faith Radio is one that's called Alone Together. Mm. And it gets at this very idea that you can be lonely because you don't have an intimate relationship, but you can also be lonely in a relationship for many different reasons. So it's not just having a person around. It Mm -hmm. really is the loneliness really develops based on that lack of a an intimate connection that you're making with someone. And by and that, that, what do you mean happen- by intimate connection? Define Well, that. I mean, where you really know somebody deeply. And so that can happen in not only romantic relationships, but that can also happen in friendships. Mm-hmm. So it could be that you don't have a good friend if there's something that's going on in your life, whether it's to share positive news or negative news or to have support from somebody, that lack of friendship Um, and those intimate relationships in your family, with your family members, where you can call a family member and say, hey, would you pray for me? I'm going through a difficult time, or I have this coming up in my day. And then, of course, most people would like some type of romantic, intimate relationship where they can do life with someone for, um, hopefully, for a number of years as they uh, get into a marriage. And then the other one that we don't always think about, Paul, is the third area that was mentioned in this book was we don't, we sometimes feel lonely because we don't really have a purpose and we don't understand our calling and why we're here. I I was just reading a report on a, a young man who 
um, was only 18 years old and he's really caught in the grips of drug addiction and stuff. But the root of all of this is, you know, he had a mom who abandoned him early on. His dad was not in his life. He went into foster care. He didn't have anybody to really guide him and coach him through life. And I imagine if you talk to him, he would say he was a very lonely child without direction or guidance. And a consequence of that is he's really struggling today because he doesn't know why he's here Mm -hmm. and he doesn't know what purpose. And I think that is definitely tied to the alarming rates of suicide that we're seeing in our culture because people don't understand that they were made in the image of God and that there's a calling on all of our lives and there's a purpose for everything that we do. Um, and so we we really need to get that that gospel out to people so they can feel and sense and know that purpose. Okay, let's talk about that just a moment. I want to pull the string. You said we were created in the image of God. And that is so key to this whole thing because God is a relational being. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he's three in one, right? Well, yeah. So he's in relationship with himself. <laughs> yeah. It's a wild concept to think about, you know, he's, but he's a triune God. So he not only created, he himself is in relationship, but he created the church with relationship. And when Jesus was here on earth, he didn't just do this thing alone. He had a band of disciples who then became his apostles, who then became, you know, the spreading of the gospel in the church. And he wants us to be in community because he wired our brains. And there's a whole field about that. It's called interpersonal neurobiology, but it's a whole field about how our brains are wired for connection with not only God, but each other. So he thought relationship was key. He kind of built it into, he built it into the hardware as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do we get our hardware as it were working better? I mean, what ways, I mean, it's it's not all on us, but there's stuff that we individually can do to find that connectedness, to move from loneliness to to connection. Yeah. Yeah. And it it, it is, it does take some courage. And I, I will say that, that if you have been somebody who's really struggled with loneliness, to go to a new church or to make yourself go to an event by yourself or to reach out to somebody that you meet and say, hey, I would like to go for coffee or would you like to get together to do something? I mean, anytime we do those types of things, we do risk rejection. Mm -hmm. But if you can move through that and continue to try, and I think that's key, you have to be intentional about this connection thing because it's so easy to sit at home and just you know, be on a device or watch TV or just be by yourself. But we know that that has so many bad physical and mental health consequences because loneliness impacts your body, your mind, your spirit, all of those things. So the, the being intentional and going out and saying, I'm going to try and I'm going to walk into that church or I'm going to try that small group or I'm going to ask this person if they would go out to dinner with me or meet me for coffee. I'm going to continue to try, even if I get some no's along the way, because you understand the importance of making those connections and really building support for yourself along the way. And you can be that support for somebody else. And that gives you a lot of joy when you can be in that type of relationship. Yeah. One thing you talked about in your article had to do with hobbies and interests. I mean, okay, say Mm -hmm. maybe you're into cross-stitch. And right. you you find a group that does cross stitch, and yeah, through something like that, you can develop these longer term friendships, right? Right, and I and I have these friends; they're just amazing. Um, he, he's just a rock star in the science world, and he's got all these patents and all these things. But they're deep, deep, um, really strong believers, and they play pickleball, mm. and they're almost eighty years old, and they play pickleball and they do it, they say they did it, first of all, to meet a lot of people, to be engaged with a lot of, and if you've ever, I've started pickleball, and if you ever do that, you see the right away people are friendly, they invite you in, you get in a group, it's a way to have fun and be around other people, but they also use it as a ministry. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was talking to him the other day, just, just the other night, and he said, yeah, and we use pickleball as a way as we as we meet people we talk to them in a very organic way we begin talking about the gospel and what um Jesus has done in our lives and why we're sort of in the state that we are today so it not only it not only helps you 
but it also gives you opportunity to speak into other people's lives. And like I said, be that support and maybe even lead someone to the Lord. You keep you, you use the word organic, which is one of those that I've been tr- delving into more because oftentimes we tr- try mechanical ways of getting connected with mm-hmm. people. Sometimes mm-hmm. just the natural, oh, you're interested in pickleball too. Okay, I'm not. Yeah. But blessings to you, Linda. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, using those natural connections to meet and connect with people, it just makes a lot of sense. Hey, Linda, thanks again for joining us here on Mornings with Carmen. Always a pleasure. Good to talk to you, Paul. Well, again, this is the this is Mornings with Carmen. And by the way, uh, you can check out Dr. Linda Mintel uh, and her. Go to drlindamintel.com. Plus, remember, weekends here on Faith Radio is the Dr. Linda Mintel Show, which you can listen to the podcast well as well anytime. Well, again, I'm Paul filling in for Carmen. And how do you handle interruptions in your life? I saw this at the website called Church Leaders. A visiting pastor, Pastor Brian Stewart, was preaching on February 15th at Mount Zion Church in Cottonwood, Alabama, when parishioner Lois Adams began coughing. Now, initially, Stewart thought, oh, okay, she's got a cold, she's got allergies, something like that. But when other worshipers became alarmed, Pastor Brian realized Ms. Adams was actually choking. A mint became lodged in her throat. Thanks to a swift application of the Heimlich Maneuver, Pastor Stewart You know, stopping a sermon, getting right in there, helping out uh, Lois. And thankfully, a few minutes later, everything was okay. Sermon resumed with uh, Pastor Brian saying, you ain't going nowhere, Miss Lois. The entire incident was captured on camera and is shared at the church's Facebook. (laughs) So anyway, again, good morning. Okay, I'm going to date myself again. There was a TV commercial way back when, back in the 70s, with the line, if you want to get somebody's attention whisper. God did that with Elijah when he was at a low point in his life. What are some of the whispers you and I need to listen to? Hopefully joining us here in three minutes, Jeff King. He's with the, he's the president of International Christian Concern, which helps people know what's happening with our persecuted brothers and sisters overseas. He's got a new devotional out called The Whisper. We'll be talking with him about that shortly here on Mornings with Carmen on Faith Radio. We live in a world of noise and distraction. I'm Paul filling in for Carmen here on Faith Radio. Yeah, so much is vying for our attention. And to make it more pronounced, yes, loud audio, bold images and video, photoshopped and digitally enhanced to grab our attention. But what is important that we need to make sure we're hearing and seeing and understanding? Some of the most profound things are not loud at all. They're, they're a whisper. Joining me now, Jeff King, president of International Christian Concern, and he wants to help us listen to the whispers of our brothers and sisters around the world. He's got a new book out called The Whisper. And Jeff, joining us now here on Mornings with Carmen. Good morning, Jeff. Oh, it's great to be with you. It is so good to have you back. And again, thank you for joining us. And as I was starting to read through The Whisper, it's like, okay, I'm going to have to sit down and go through this, you know, it's a devotional. It's a 30-day devotional. I'm finding myself yeah. saying, I got to do this. I got yeah. to do this. So thank you for what you started here. Now, first, though, you had to learn to hear the whispers yourself because, okay, talk Ooh. about your story because you were kind of the party guy back in high school and college. And <laughs> <laughs> tell us how you started hearing the whispers. Well, I, I grew up in, in an atheist agnostic home. And, you know, really, honestly, I never thought of it, but I, the first whisper I heard was when I was in sixth grade, I knew there was a God and I felt him pulling at me. I didn't know how I was to find him, where he was. I found a Bible in our house from uh, my dad's college course, Bible Lit course, and it was a Schofield Bible. So I started reading that in sixth grade, but it took about 10, I'm trying to think, 10, 12 years, I, uh, I got saved at 23 or 24, radically saved, um, <clears throat> and was in a church that was, it was very much the Jesus Revolution product, mm. you know, these guys were evangelism beasts, and and I loved ministry, I loved evangelism, but I thought I can't be poor, I'm not going to go into ministry, so I went into banking, I went into corporate, and then mortgage banking, and 
um, and then got called into, you know, absolute calling up, called into Campus Crusade for Christ crew and ran around the world. Uh, and then uh, eventually the Lord moved me into ICC through a miraculous dream. And uh, after that, so the whoa, Lord... Whoa, 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 Tell us about <laughs> the stream. Tell, <laughs> tell us about the stream, man. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm with crew. I've been with crew yeah. for Campus Crusade for Christ for like nine years. And then my support starts to fall apart. You have to raise your own financial support. Right. And my support starts to fall apart. I can't do anything to fix it. And it had always been very easy. The Lord had said, I'm going to take care of that for you. I had the president write letters for me. Nothing was working. And then finally I realized he was pulling me out of there. But there's no answer. And I don't want to go back to secular work. I'm like, oh, I could I could end being poor. That'd be great. But I don't really – I want to do ministry. And so it gets to the point where I'm just, woe is me, you know, my gosh, here I am, your faithful servant, and then, you know, feeling sorry for myself. And I go out to California for a meeting with the Jesus film. And during the night, uh, this is what I'm going to describe as all a dream. So I'm in, I'm sleeping, and I have this dream talking to an imaginary businessman. Okay. And I'm talking to him on the phone, and I hang up, and I decide to go by his business, and his business – uh, is operated out of a home that's like this prototypical home from where I'm from, from Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside D.C. And so uh, I hang up, I go by, all his workers are standing outside. And I'm like, hey, where's Bill, the the owner of the business? And they're like, Bill's gone. Oh, well, that, where is he? No, he's gone, gone. He's dead. He's not dead. I was just talking to him. Yes, he is. This is, you know, we're going back and forth. And they get all agitated finally. And they're saying, I'm telling you, he's dead. He dropped dead. We're really scared. Do you want to run the business? And that's it. That was the dream. So no more, no more weird than any other dream. But I wake up, and I'm on West Coast time, but an East Coast old friend has called. It's like our back. And now we're switching to the real world. So I'm, I call her back. And she says, my husband and I are connected to this organization, and their founder just dropped dead. And all I can think is you're the guy that's supposed to run this thing. Are you interested? So that's the dream. That's the miraculous thing. And so this or that organization was ICC. Okay. Now, the curious thing is, you know, what do you do? So first of all, you know, you, it's, it, it's a wow moment, but you can't just call up the board and say, hey, guys, I had the dream. You're supposed to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would sound pretty presumptuous there. Yeah. <laughs> Or you're in the crackpot category, you know, so you just have to wait. And then so finally it took a couple of months when they hired me. I said, I've been dying to tell you something. So and that kind of leads into what the whisper is named, what the book is about. And so I get dropped into this world of persecution. Now, I, I you know, I had run around the world for 10 years in professional ministry you know, in an international ministry, but I didn't know a ton about persecution. I was in lots of closed countries, so, but I'm an expert by no means, and I get dropped into ICC, and I start opening the files to understand the ministry and how it works, and oh my gosh, it's just a horror show, uh, what you're seeing, and, uh, you know, but and I'm like, wow, but all during this time, these first couple months, the Lord is whispering to me over and over. And he's saying, I want you to learn the lessons of the persecuted church, from the persecuted and the martyrs. So they have lessons of great importance, and all of us are self-absorbed. So he's like, it's not about you. It's I want you to share these things. I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, I'm a get-after guy. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to learn? I'll do that, and I'll start, you know, shouting these lessons. And, mm -hmm. and if you had to sum up the Lord's voice, and it was over and over, clear as day. And it was, it was listen, learn, and shout. He didn't say it that way, but, but that's the message boiled down. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, let me get after it. I'm going to learn this, and then I can start shouting. And, you know, this, this takes like 10 years. It's, mm -hmm. it's a real process. Right. And, and I'm listening, and I'm watching. And, but then soon after those early days, I go to China, and I'm I'm in a meeting. I had asked for a meeting with pastors that had been in prison for the long term. And so I had a meeting with five or six pastors, and this lasted for hours. Mm -hmm. um, and these guys, and it was guys and gals, but these guys had been in the concentration camps. And 
The shortest prison sentence was 10 years. The longest was 24 years. And this is a gift given to me by the Lord. You know, that, that time, I've just treasured it ever since. And I want to tell you just a couple things that stuck out from that time. And, and I, I asked him, I said, tell me about persecution. And they said, persecution is a gift. Hmm. And kind of my brow goes up and, you know, I'm a big city guy on the street smart. I'm like, oh, is this marketing? What is this? <laughs> you know? And it's like, and I'm a marketer at heart. And they're like, well, what is this? And they said, no, it's, it's not a normal gift. You know, I said, it's not one you'd ever want. It's not one you'd ever want to give to give to anybody, but it's a gift because it breaks us. And in that breaking, we become dependent and we become very close. They didn't say it exactly like that, but that's what they're saying very clearly. We become dependent and then his power can flow through us. Mm, yeah. And the other big note was this. I said, what's your biggest worry? And again, this is, these are the highlights from a couple of hours of conversation. What's your biggest worry? And they said, our biggest worry is that the pastors that we are mentoring that are coming up and going to take our place, our biggest worry is that these guys haven't been hunted and uh, arrested and imprisoned and tortured and murdered like we have been. Mm. And they had my attention, I'll tell you what. That's kind of how I start the whisper. I was like, <laughs> wow. You did, you did. We're talking yeah. with Jeff King. He's the author of the new devotional book, called The Whisper. I'm Paul. Thank you again for listening to Faith Radio. Jeff, um, oftentimes when we, especially us, I hate to say this about us in America, but we hear the story of our persecuted brothers and sisters, and oftentimes we kind of go, oh, that's hard. I'm sorry. And yeah. and maybe, okay, we hear organizations like yours and a few of the others that help bring this to our attention, but we don't internalize the message, like you're trying to help us do here. I mean, you you talked about how you had the shift. Yeah. I mean, these Chinese pastors who had gone through so much suffering. Yeah. Take you, okay, you heard them talk. Take us to that moment. What was going through your mind as you were leaving them? Yeah, well, that, that was, you know, I think anybody that hears that, that's a, you know, you're, it's deer in the headlights. Your eyes pop open. You're like, wow, what the heck could that all mean? And I didn't exactly just absorb that and then start running with it. But that was what started to rattle around my brain. And it took about 10 years. And Paul, I got to tell you, you know, I, I, like I said, I gave you the, you know, thumbnail sketch of my history, my testimony. So I'm an evangelism beast. I'm a, I'm a guy that's all about evangelism and revival. Mm -hmm. And I would, Ask the Lord, what, what am I doing in persecution? It's such a little uh, niche of the Christian world, so important, but an absolute niche, you know, because it seems like their message is all about death, and so people shy away. So I began to understand something, though, you know, and that idea of the gift, it became more clear over time, and and I understood then what the Lord was doing, because the message that's coming from the persecuted church is universal. It's for all believers. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the experience that all of us are going through. Now it's different for us in the West. So there they're persecuted for their faith. Now that's not us yet. We're doing persecution light right now. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's a trajectory, but we're not doing real persecution and we don't get thrown in prison for our faith, but we do get thrown in prison for divorce and bankruptcy and anxiety um, and health concerns when you get those, you know, the terminal diagnosis and, and other things that are chronic and just, you name it, mm -hmm. you know, marriage, et cetera, on and on. We are in prison all the time yeah. and we don't have the resources to endure our sentence. And so who do we look to? And we look to those who well spent endured. 24 years. Yeah in the prison camps and came out as godly, godly people that are burning with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And they have so much to teach us and they, they have the manna for us when we are starving. They have the light that showed, they found the light as they went through the long darkness 
So these things are universal. What they're teaching us is absolutely universal and so important for each of us, no matter where we are in life. But as long as we're a serious believer that's trying to get somewhere or a person, again, that's even going through suffering and trying to understand it, because the suffering, what I see is this, the suffering, it's not a destination. Now it can, it can endure and it can mm-hmm. endure for a lifetime at times, but it's not a destination. No. It's not the point. It's a door to transformation. Right. I, I and, tell you what, Jeff, I want yeah. you to put the, we have to take a break. I'm going to put the pause sure, there. Sorry. When we come back, I want you to tell, and hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Yeah. Tabaruku. Tabaruka. Yeah. I mean, he, and how you, how you end the devotional on him. Cause tell you what, I'm, I don't want to say too much more because I want people to hear his yeah. story, and I want you to share that with us in about 90 seconds. Again, this is uh, Faith Radio. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen. If you're a new listener, we want to officially welcome you with a free welcome pack gift. Request yours today at MyFaithRadio.com. Okay, so we're hearing stories of brothers and sisters in Jesus who are being persecuted. And we kind of get angry. We think about the persecutor. Are we listening to the whisper of the persecuted in these situations? That's what I'm hoping we do. That's what Jeff King is inviting us to do. His new book is called The Whisper. And and Jeff, I wanted you to continue as we um, look at the story. And I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. But Tabaruka, is that correct? I've pronounced it every different way. So that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, he... His story, you lead off with the story in the devotions, mm-hmm. if you remember right. Mm-hmm. And I want you to share it because the yeah. way he, the place he points us in his life is the whisper we need to hear. Yeah. Tell me about it. Well, he was a, a Muslim convert, and I, he's not representative. It's a real story. So I have seen so many of these guys come to Christ. So if you're in a fundamentalist uh, country or you're in a fundamentalist family and you come to Christ, you're going to be risking it all. And depending on the family, they'll, the family is the one that will murder you. So he was drawn to Christ. And there is a real uh, process that Muslim interested person goes through. So basically, you know, they've been – living life trying to find God uh, within the confines of Islam. But what they find is law and obedience, and there's no assurance of salvation. Even Muhammad himself said he didn't know. And so it's all law. It's all justice. And there's great fear of condemnation. And so when the believer, like Tabaruku, when he sees Jesus, what happens is, you know, they, they end up meeting somebody and they say, let me give you this Bible when they're ready. And they start reading this Bible. And so for me, this is so striking because they see something. They see something that we used to see. But we're old. If you've been in the faith, you're like an old married couple. (laughs) You know, you were dating that girl, that guy. Oh, my gosh. They were it. And then over time, you're like, you know, it's just life, right? Mm -hmm. But they see something and they are like, oh, my gosh. This is the one that has the words of life. Where could I go? I have to follow this one. And it's like they it's like we're all orphaned from the fall. As a as a human being and as a believer, we have been orphaned. So we fell from a great height. There is something deeply missing in us, and we can't even put our finger on it. But it's like we're orphans that have been dropped off in the big city in the middle of winter mm-hmm. and we have to survive on the streets. And they see Jesus and they say, my gosh, that is home. Because Jesus says to them, I want to adopt you. And I'm going to take you to a place that's warm and sheltered and you'll be safe with me. And you'll never have to worry again, no matter what happens. So mm-hmm. Tabaruku took that chance and he, he grabbed Jesus. Now he knew the cost and he ended up being murdered by his father. Quite mm-hmm. horrible. And yet, and he had many chances to turn. There's lots of pressure. There's always lots of pressure to turn back, and he would not because he can't go back to the streets. He found home, so it doesn't matter. I don't care what you're going to take from me. I don't care if you even take my life. That's just another idol. It's another bauble. There's nothing that compares with the treasure of Jesus, and this is what we have lost as believers, and so we see it so clearly. 
Yeah. And that is this. What is it about Jesus? That's it. That's why they're drawn, and that's why we were drawn to him. Yeah. I love how you ended out that chapter, and this is an amazing thought. You, you wrote this. Most people would say that Tabaruka followed Jesus to his death, but I think it's clear. He followed him to life. And if he could bridge the gap back to this world, he would shout at the top of his lungs, now I can truly see what God is, and he's more than I could have imagined. He is the answer to the death that you call life. He is the life that you call death. My death was merely the doorway to life. So with everything you have, with all your effort, stop living on the streets and find home. Yeah. You landed it wonderfully there. I mean, oh, are we truly, are we so caught up in this world at home here instead of truly finding our home with Jesus himself? The answer is yes. yes. I gotta, <laughs> for I gotta, all of us. For I, all of us. I give you one more minute because you, uh, and it is literally a minute, but you said <laughs> God has one beef with us and it isn't our sin. It's what is not his our beef, sin. What is his beef with us? Listen, this is, you know, this really comes from uh, one of the lieutenants of Watchman Nee, and, but it's biblical. And we see we're so focused on our sin and trying to stop sinning so much. But the, the deep, deep problem we have is our independence. It's our self-reliance. This is the gift of suffering that the Lord has to have in our life to break our independence. And so we become connected once again. And he can't take us to where he wants to take us unless we go through suffering with him and are broken free. And it's a door to transformation. Suffering is not a destination. He wants to take us somewhere. And we just need to work with him and walk with him through the process. Mm. Thanks a lot, Jeff, for joining us this morning again. The book is called The Whisper and uh, just came out last week, wasn't it? So Yes, sir. I- I'm kind of looking at this one as maybe I want to use this as in March during Lent. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. That's just what I'm thinking. That's just what I'm thinking, but it's good anytime. But Jeff, thanks again for joining us here on uh, Mornings with Carmen. Bless you, brother. Bless you. Bless you. Hey, real quickly, um, c- cool story about a ne- guy named Larry. He's a bus driver. Kid came on the bus crying. It was pajama day and he didn't have any pajamas. So what did Larry do? He t- He just brought the touch of grace. He quickly ran over to the family dollar, grabbed a couple of pair Went back to the school, gave Levi, the little boy, a little joy that day. Can you be that touch of joy for somebody today? And when you do it, may the Lord, may the favor of the Lord be upon you. And may he establish the work of your hands today. Thanks again for listening to Faith Radio. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.